calling him. Grace, Grace Blessed Hopley. Yeah. Absolute pleasure to have you in the studio. Very, very genuinely very excited at this one. Very happy. Um, had Keith Abrams on before. Mm -hmm. Keith Abram. Abrams. Keith Abrams on before. The subject of uh, the use of psychedelics for the potential treatment, or potential use of psychedelics for treatment of mental ill health. PTSD, TBIs, etc., of which I am not a subject matter expert, mm -hmm. but I think you are. Yes. Prove it to me. What's your authority on the matter? Can you give me your credentials, your background, so listeners, Absolutely. viewers know? So uh, I've got a, a background in neuroscience, and I completed a, a PhD at King's College London mm -hmm. that very much looked into uh, mental health, causes of mental health, and links between that and psychotropic drugs. So, you know, one of the things I, I did a lot of research on was cannabis and cannabis use and not only how that can be um, a negative impact on the brain but but then starting to look at how it might be a positive impact and then further to that carried on my research got more interested in psychotropic drugs outside of cannabis so things like psychedelics and then from there have been working for um, a number of years as a postdoc and then more recently as the research director within Heroic Hearts working with both the U.S. charity that's been um, in place for a number of years now and then the U.K. Char uh, charity, which we've been working on for the last couple of years. And then I guess alongside that, which has slightly, slightly led me to work at Heroic Hearts, was I, I, I trained as a, a yoga teacher, mainly because I, I love yoga and I just sort of wanted to do something with my time. And, and as I did that, looking more and more into that as a therapeutic aspect and the idea of sort of body work and breath work for treatment of trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And then, as you know, I, I, I'm a, also a member of the Reserved Armed Forces. So in the Venn diagram of life that crosses over between a neuroscientist, a yoga teacher and uh, uh, an army officer, working for Heroic Hearts seemed like the perfect place for, for me to be. And now I basically control the research output from what we do. The primary aims of the charity, as I think have probably been re previously stated, is to to help veterans to, to find some kind of peace and healing from any mental health uh, issues that they've suffered as a result of their service. Mm -hmm. But alongside that, we also want to champion what we are doing and, and, and make sure that what we're doing is right and what we're doing is the best practice and is helping people. And the way to do that is by doing good, meaningful research. And that's my job. Excellent. Excellent. Can we nail some terminology at mm -hmm. the minute? Right. Psychedelic, psychotropic. Mm -hmm. what, what, yes, can you explain sorry. those me, please? So psychotropic is <coughs> basically anything that affects the way that the brain is operating and thinking. So something like cannabis, caffeine, uh, antidepressants, all of those things would be classed as psychotropic drugs because they go into the brain, they work on receptors in the brain that are to do with um, the way the brain works and they alter that. Psychedelics, you have something, uh, we have sort of classic psychedelics and non-classic psychedelics, but I, I won't bore you too much with that, but the, the idea of them is they mostly work on serotonin receptors in the brain. Ser serotonin is a, a neurotransmitter that deals a lot with mood and the way we feel um, and they affect those areas. And in classic psychedelics that leads to altered ways of thinking that can lead to hallucinogenic experiences. So when I say psychedelics I think a lot of people would be more used to hearing the word hallucinogenic. So when we talk about psychedelics just to outline what a few of them are that's probably the easiest way to start Yeah, you know, classic psychedelics would be something like magic mushrooms so psilocybin is the is the component of magic mushrooms that is the the psychedelic part that goes into the brain works on the serotonin receptors in a way that changes the way that your brain is working during that period of time and then you have other things like DMT, which is part of a, a root in a plant in, that's grown in the Amazon jungle that forms part of a drug called ayahuasca. And there's other <coughs> similar ones, like some in cactuses in America. And then you have slightly less 
classical psychedelics, which are things like MDMA. So uh, what I guess people might know of as ecstasy, a party drug. So manufactured would be non would be non classic ones. So. No, no, no. It's not that it's manufactured. So LSD would be a classic psychedelic, and that is uh, manufactured but it works in a very similar way. It's just that they don't work in such a direct manner on serotonin receptors. It's it's much more to do with how trippy are they, <laughs> I suppose. Those that really give you full sort of hallucinogenic experiences are seen as the classic psychedelics, whereas other ones like MDMA are they don't give you that hallucinogenic experience and the way that they work is slightly more complicated. So alcohol is psychotropic then? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't realise it was that broader term. Uh, as, as it, sorry, not broader term. It, it, that was a bigger, bigger scope of what could fall under being psychotropic. Okay. LSD's acid, right? Yes. That, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, where did this start? So where did the... F uh, oh, in fact, I should explain. If you hear growling... If you listen to this or watching and you hear a growling, it's just myself and Grace and you can see <laughs> or listen. The growling is not us, it's uh, Grace's dog, uh, who's also joined us in the studio and is guard keeping, man in the door. And you, can, you can hear stuff outside, so it's just protecting us, it's yeah. fine. Okay, uh, where did it start? So where did the potential use of psychedelics um, for treatment of mental ill health come about? Yeah, so I guess the, the origins are millennia old at this point. There's very good evidence to suggest that many tribes all over the world have been using psychedelics in various different ceremonies, et cetera, et cetera, for ritualistic reasons, sort of <coughs> marking certain age mi milestones um, or particular moments in their, their life. And from that has come an awful wealth of knowledge. And that continues on in places like South America within the tribes there, the use of ayahuasca. But definitely existed within Europe with something like the, the magic mushroom. The, the, the particular fungus that has psilocybin content grows on pretty much every continent um, around the globe. And so at some point, it's it's pretty logical to believe that they have been taken by various tribes, etc. So, fast forwarding that a bit, we saw the the development or the discovery of, of LSD within the last century in uh, sort of medicine here and in modern medicine, and that was very much seen as a medicine and was used as such. And there were studies that were done in the sixties that looked at the way that psychedelics could be used for treatment of people with trauma but that all got shut down when they became controlled substances and then mdma the same was happening with them so mdma was used for treatment of um, veterans from vietnam war all the way up until the early 80s when that was then starting to be used as a recreational drug and so the, the powers that be saw that as, as a problem and so re, rescheduled that to be uh, the classified substance that it is today. So the discovery that psychedelic drugs were useful in the context of psychiatric help was originally done in the sort of 60s, 70s, 80s in studies that were perhaps a little avant-garde but were still nonetheless decent studies. I mean, av avant-garde was sort of how science worked a bit more back then. But then as a result of rescheduling, it was all completely shut down. And then in the early 2000s, we saw people say, OK, well, actually, maybe we need to dig this up again and start having a look at it. And so we started to see people using um, MDMA for the treatment of PTSD was one of the first ones that sort of came back online. And then slowly, slowly, we've seen labs around the world take back up the mantle of, of psychedelic drugs in the as useful substances for the treatment of psychiatric disorders. And we've actually been incredibly pioneering here in the UK with the, um, the people at Imperial College. So they said okay well we've sort of seen these really great psychological studies but let's actually have a look what's going on and they with sort of great pain spoke with the um the government to be able to get the licenses to do so and carried out 
studies where they put people into MRI machines. Uh, so there's something called functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you're able to look at the brain working. And they gave them um, LSD and psilocybin, and they put them in, ha had a look at what was going on. <laughs> and it was amazing. I would not want to be in that tunnel <laughs> on acid. <laughs> no, you really no wouldn't. Way. <laughs> no way. I, th I think they did actually have a bit of it. I read through some of, the, of the, their papers and um, they did actually have a bit of an issue with keeping them still because they're just <laughs> having a lovely time and <laughs> you can't be wiggling around in an MRI machine. So so they then started to look, okay, well, what is this actually doing? And now we are, we are seeing uh, a huge return of psychedelic drug research and that is kind of... I don't want to say exploding, but it, it's growing in a vast way. All over um, the academic world, we're seeing psychedelic research centers popping up, which is fantastic because, you know, the more we know, the better it is. And then that's been hugely mirrored in the financial world. There's been incredible amounts of money that has been thrown into psychedelic companies that have been set up with the anticipation that what we are seeing in this, in the early stages of, of drug development using psychedelics is going to translate into uh, some monetary value for the, <laughs> the, the people who've, who do that sort of thing. So <coughs> that's where it all started. That's kind of where we are now. We're now in a position where if I just sort of outline what, what we know at the moment, we've had a number of, clinical studies that have come through. There's a fantastic study that was released this year that was a, a phase three clinical trial using MDMA. That was, what does phase three mean? So what? Go on. Uh, so it's like end of the sort of road uh, drug development testing. So by the time you're at phase three, you're using the drug in the intended population oh. that would you would use the the drug for on a trial basis yeah okay so that was an mdma trial in people with ptsd and that was people with a, ra uh, a range of different ptsd but within that was a cohort of veterans and in the uk no this was over in america but there is actually a center that is going to do the next part um at king's college with uh, another great charity called um supporting wounded, wounded veterans and <coughs> They found that this sort of using MDMA along with psychotherapy was hugely beneficial for PTSD, particularly in comparison to what treatments were currently available. And then when we turn to something like psilocybin, we've had great studies that have looked at um, depression and they've they've tested psilocybin against, you know, your, your average antidepressant and found it to be more beneficial, which is great. And more and more of these little studies are starting to come out. And many are currently underway. Um, and looking at not just depression, but anxiety, substance use disorders, end of life um, anxiety, anorexia, and then PTSD, which is where my focus really is. Is So is the impact of psychedelics on for psychiatric treatment and psychiatry um, on the psyche. Is that partly because of a neurophysiological effect that they're having? Yes. As well as the, the, the psychiatric effect of, for example, a change of perspective in the way you perceive what's mm -hmm. going on in your life, in, in whatever dramas you've got going down, right? Yeah. Yes. But then I would kind of say to you well, what we, we think and perceive. I think sometimes we keep the idea of neuroscience and psychology in two separate boxes. But actually, what I really love about my job is I very much sort of sit in that, that intermediate bit where you try and say, well, I'm looking at the brain and it looks like this and you're telling me you're feeling this and trying to marry those two together. So you're right, there's uh, definitely a neurophysiological effect of these substances, not just in the acute period that they are, people are on the drug, but actually there seems to be this sort of after effect, which um, is, is really fascinating and amazing. But if you tie what we see 
from a neurophysiological effect into what we know people say that they are experiencing, it looks very much the same. So if I kind of explain that to you, when you, in a very, very simple sense, when you have something like post-traumatic stress disorder, what you end up getting is a very rigid bit of circuitry where the brain is sort of stuck thinking about ruminating in some ways around a particular pathway, a particular thought pattern. And the way to break that rumination, to be able to think more broadly, more widely, to introduce other ideas or thought patterns in, <clears throat> would be what you would need to do in order to, to break that, that sort of continuous loop of thought. And so when you see people, uh, someone's brain, when they've taken a, a psychedelic, what happens is you, you get this parts of the thinking brain start sort of flooding in to the emotional part of the brain, but basically causing almost like a flood of, of pathways to open up and start firing. And what that does is strengthen the ability for other pathways to happen, but decreases the dominance of that pathway that is that continuous loop of thought. And so, I, I hope I'm making sense there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you then see on a neurophysiological level more pathways lighting up and then people tell you, oh, well, I just feel like I, I can think about more things and therefore, you know, re-rationalize whatever a, a particular trauma thought is or something. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, that after, yeah, I, I, yeah, you mentioned earlier, like the, the immediate impact of it and then the after effect. Mm -hmm. So let's say during my adult life, mm -hmm. I did acid once. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave that broadly during my adult, adult yeah. life, right? Um, and the experience at the time was, this is wild. Like being super, super stoned, I would describe it. Super, super stoned with, mm. with um, s hallucinations. Slight, mild, right? Mm -hmm. Not like green men, but mm -hmm. shit was moving. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but then the, the, for days after, my God, that's the most chilled I've ever been. The most relaxed I've ever been. Ever, ever, ever been ever been and um I, I i sort of put it down to two things the the, pers the change of perspective that i had on because of the thoughts i was having when i was under the like consciously under the influence of mm -hmm. the lsd mm -hmm. and then the the sort of the neuroscience neuroscience side of it the, the fact that it was still in my body in a residual level mm -hmm. until it went out um i, I remember i was walking home and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop waffling in a minute, but I don't think I've told this story on the, on the podcast before, but I was walking home, I was still off my nut, right? Mm -hmm. But fine enough to walk home. Okay. And uh, during the experience, my forearms, I were constantly, uh, they were like agitated. My forearms, I was constantly clenching my fists. It was just a real agitation on my forearms, both of them, mm -hmm. as if it was, as if they were, yeah, I don't know I don't know how to explain it. Not like lactic acid, but it was something I was having the, Clench my fist constantly to get rid of it. That was the only negative thing I had going on. And then on the walk home, I thought, um, I thought in my head, I thought, what if? Because it, it, it had stopped. This is about half past 11 at night. Okay. Took it about one o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. About half 11 at night walking back. Uh, and it's, I realized, oh, it stopped. It's gone. And I thought, what if all that tension in your forearms, that is all that like uh, stress and anxiety that you constantly walk around with, mm -hmm. that was that disappearing. And it's gone. And mm -hmm. you've got rid of it now. That is it. Mm -hmm. Gone. It's gone. And the acid has done that. It's gone. And I laughed at myself. I laughed hard. Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. You're still off your nut. Yeah. And then I woke up in the morning and I was chilled out. Oh my God. Maybe just by thinking mm -hmm. that, that perspective change is sort of made it mm -hmm. happen when nothing's really happened. I've just changed my thinking. Bizarre. Anyway, that was that's my, that's my acid trip experience. I wanted to get out there, didn't it? Go on. Well, <laughs> I, so you sort of say, oh, well, I was just thinking that, so how could it be? But I think that we sometimes really downplay the importance of 
thinking and the importance of the narrative that we hold about ourselves in terms of our physical health. Look at something like the placebo effect. <coughs> you tell somebody something is going to be good for them and they take it and it's a sugar pill, but what, for whatever reason, they get better. The brain is unbelievably powerful at controlling not only you know, the way that we perceive the world, and that is as a physical experience as well as a mental experience. It's sort of strongly believed, or strongly believed, it's, it's very well documented that you know there are people who have certain traumas in their life, and it comes out later as sort of autoimmune disease and uh, chronic pain and and all of these things. And so perhaps that thought process is right, and in in almost in having that thought process, those stresses that you you believe that you were carrying around, your brain then felt like it was able to resolve them in some way. It felt like it had done the necessary work to perhaps contextualize them or, or whatever and then say, OK, that's done. I don't have to carry that around anymore. I don't have to have that stress. And maybe that's why you felt much calmer after the experience, because perhaps you had done some resolutionary work on stresses that you were holding. Yeah, uh, that's what I think. I, I, so one of the, you know, one of the sort of epiphanies I've had over the over the last few years in dealing with mental health, basically, is... <coughs> And understand it better and thinking, like you said, the importance of thinking, flipping heck, is is how impactful a change of perspective in your situation can be. Mm -hmm. But be able to uh, and and understanding how you can change your perspective because not everyone can do it, right? You, you know, you're in a you're in a bad place. If you can change that situation somehow, your environment, mm -hmm. your life, your mm -hmm. literally where you sat, whatever, then it can change the way you're thinking about a thing. <coughs> And your introspection, uh, if that's the right word. So yeah, and that's what I think with the that LS, the LSD experience is, mm -hmm. like you say now, I changed my perspective. I looked at it, and I was looking at the problem in a different way, or the problem I didn't think, think was a problem. Looking mm -hmm. at it a different way, you know. I thought, what, basically, what are you doing? <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's almost like you're able to realise sometimes quite how silly some of the patterns or rituals that you've been partaking in have become, you know, the time and energy wasted on worrying. Um, and when, you know, and you're so, and you're so right, I was, one of my favorite phrases is always, uh, a change is better than a rest. And it, and it is so, so true. Just so, sometimes like you say, if you just go and sit the other side of the room, you'll feel, you'll feel much different. But when, we talk about the w thinking and, and all the rest of it. So if we sort of slightly step away from, from the very medical idea of, 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 of PTSD and, and psychedelics for PTSD and, and look at it a little bit more as a, as a transient experience that you have under the influence of psychedelics. A lot of that is basically people being to access, being able to access their own narrative. We all walk around every, the whole time with this narrative of who we are, what we've done, what we know, what we believe, what our values are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And even though we might not think it, but that informs the way that we feel and behave and react the whole time. And what seems to be the case with um, particularly classic psychedelics, when we look at observational studies where we sort of ask people, okay, you know, after their trip, how did you find it, blah, blah, blah. One of the things that seems to come through is, you know, A, it is this hugely profound experience, but a lot of the time people are able to sort of observe themselves, observe their behaviors, observe their beliefs, and kind of say, why am I carrying this around? Why am I, you know, and almost sort of visualize the sort of weight of certain beliefs or feelings. And make that decision to say, well, I'm not going to... Actually, I, that, I don't think that really resonates to me anymore. I don't really want that to be a part of who I am. Um, and so make the almost conscious decision to, to, to change your own narr narrative. I think that's incredibly valuable, incredibly powerful. I think it's incredibly powerful, not only with dealing with <coughs> past traumas, which, um, you know... Is a, a, a great thing but also say when someone is in the military 
it is who you are. It becomes such a part of your identity, such a part of um, how you perceive yourself. And it's no coincidence that if you look at PTSD rates, it's normally about 6% of people who are still, it's about 6% of people who are serving who, who have some um, sort of level of PTSD, but it's 17% of veterans. Well, why is that? Well, quite possibly because a, a lot of the trauma and stuff happens once you leave and once you have to recontextualize yourself and who you are as a civilian. And the experience of psychedelics and a lot of what we get reported back is not just about that dealing with the trauma in the past, but it's about rethinking who you are now and who you're going to be in the future and saying, okay, I was that person. I was that soldier. I was, um, you know, you know, whatever your number is or this, that, the other, however you identified yourself, but that's not who you are now. And who am I going to be now? What, what values do I hold as a civilian? Could that 17% be, sorry to interrupt, mm. could that 17% higher, that higher figure also partly be due to a propensity to misdiagnose as well, especially in veterans? How do you mean? Sorry. Uh, so presentation <laughs> of certain, because with PTSD, right, mm -hmm. it's like those, the, the, the symptoms that you could would commonly associate with PTSD are also commonly associated with other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, substance use disorder, chronic yeah, pain. Yeah, I, I know, I, I, yeah. also feed, all feed into each other as well. Yeah, right? um, yeah, that was yeah, that was my question. Could it be mis like, mis partly misdiagnosis with a high figure, like a, like a, an, an eagerness to di diagnose with PTSD by instead GPs. of those other things? Yeah. Well, I think that those other things are symptoms of PTSD. Okay. To be honest, I think particularly when we look at substance use disorder in veterans, why why do lots of veterans drink perhaps so much? Well, a lot of the time it's because they're using it as a medication for feeling anxious or feeling, you know, whatever else. And, th and that then becomes what people see. The symptom then becomes what people c think is, is the diagnosis, but actually it's not. And the same with, with chronic pain. People who, you know, chronic back pain, but actually, is it chronic back pain or is it trauma that is being suppressed so heavily? That's how they are experiencing that trauma. Mm. Is um is there anywhere, in fact, yeah, yeah, is there anywhere that is legally, actively using psychedelics to treat, uh, you know, just is just, just a common thing to treat um mental health, P PTSD in military or in some other way, general population maybe. Mm -hmm. And if not, how close are we to getting to that stage? I say we, I mean the world. You know, <laughs> US yeah. is ahead of us, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but it's a bit complicated in the US because of the way that they have state and federal law. So lots of states have kind of said, yeah, let's go for it. But federal law is still very much oh. no. So how that actually plays out is um, difficult to interpret so in the netherlands it is legal to use psilocybin tr truffles which is not it's just a different part of the mushroom uh, so there are there are clinics there that exist for people to go to and and they can do it on a very recreational sense or they can go there as a with a specific reason for what they want to find um there is a guy that we work with now and we're going forward going to be doing our own retreats over in the netherlands who is an ex-veteran himself he held some clinics this summer just gone with some um i think they were dutch sf guys he's a dutch veteran is he he's, he's dutch okay, yeah, yeah yeah he's yeah. dutch and uh, they yeah they held a couple of different retreats with some some special forces guys that were in incredible and some of the reports that came out of that about how well that was received and how how well the participants sort of viewed the experience was great what a lot of what we do in uh, the american side of the charity is we send people down to peru to the amazon jungle which is where the ayahuasca um, ceremonies take place within the indigenous populations that live down there and that's something as a UK charity we're now doing. So we're, we're actually sending our first load of guys out to Peru 
in a couple of months' time. So those are the sort of your main two options. Jamaica, you can go and take psilocybin for um, for mental uh, health reasons, and and that's where we're, we're also going to be doing some retreats ourselves. As far as clinical practice within um, healthcare systems, Canada actually has a compassionate use case that has now seen, I believe it may be up to about 30 people go through, and that's 30 people who are um, sort of approaching the end of their lives with cancer and are experiencing quite you know horrible anxiety symptoms around <coughs> that. And they can be treated with um, psilocybin for anxiety, really, which is amazing. Yeah, and so that that's a compassionate use case, and that's something that actually we would love to get here. A for the same reasons for for people uh, with end of life cancer anxiety. Um, right, but so, so, do you know what, what what baffles me here? Yeah, right. So they'll approve it to treat someone mm -hmm. to make them improve their mental health yeah. at the end of their life yeah how about doing it when you're in your life and you've got loads of years to live Mad, madness <laughs> what are you doing isn't it exactly because if there's going to be a massive issue right surely as in if the worry is the risk mm -hmm. of oh we don't mm -hmm. know what it'll mm -hmm. do and mm -hmm. well we're well, quite happy to give it to someone who's immunocompromised for example they've got cancer yeah, yeah. and you're going to give it to them when every second's precious give anyway that's my rant one <laughs> Well, yeah, you see my point. It's madness. Absolutely, it it is, and and it's quite. I mean, it it's a start, and it's great because for those people, they then actually find the reports that come out of that are that those people find real calmness, peace, and purpose and meaning to the end of their lives. Are they microdosing, or are they getting no. off in it? Uh, I don't think we call it getting off the nut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. They're they're macro doses, as we would call it. So so having a, a hallucinogenic, well, not a hallucinogenic experience is not quite how I'd like to describe it. But they're they're having an experience, a transient experience with it, um, and they find that very meaningful and often able to put some sense into the experience that they're having and what the end of their life might mean to them. And that's fantastic, right? That is, yeah. I think that's that's one thing we would do an awful lot better, that having a good death is much better than having a long life at times. Ooh, I need to think that one through. Yeah. I think sometimes we, we force people to live into their sort of 90s as these <laughs> rather unfunctioning beings and are they really living whereas actually i think it would be better if we perhaps stopped eking out every last drop of breath from people and instead let them sort of live out the last few days of their lives in a more meaningful manner mm. maybe but that's why do the indigenous tribes use ayahuasca why are they doing it is, is, are they do they are they able to provide like reasoning for it or is it just simply tradition that they do it so a lot of it's in a religious context oh. for them. So it's part of, of their ceremonial um, <coughs> aspects of their religion. And, and a lot of the times it's not actually the people, as it were, that take the drug. It's the shamans. So they have, you know, sort of slightly witch doctory esque people within their, um, within their populations. And they often take the drug to contact the spirit world uh, but I, I, I'm majorly generalizing here obviously between different tribes they've got different reasons that they do it and it's not you know I f for me it is about bringing these medicines to use for us and not just taking their culture and saying well let's all let's all go to the jungle for me it's about creating protocols that work within within um within our lives and the way that we want to treat people but yeah yeah l largely for ceremonial spiritual reasons is is why they they take it so in the trials uh, um when the states like they've been done um what uh, and netherlands um what is it showing so what's uh, in fact first question is what are those what does the treatment look like 
mm-hmm. for PTSD treatment? What does it look like? Mm-hmm. And what is it showing results wise? So the treatment that exists at the moment, I suppose, or is most fully formed would be the MDMA <coughs> protocol. So I, I'm i going to slightly approximate on this because I, I can't fully remember it 100% off the top of my head, but basically what it looks like is psychotherapy where you go in and you have over sort of 10 weeks, 10 sessions of psychotherapy. But on two of those sessions, it'll be eight hours long and you'll take MDMA and you'll sit there with a psychotherapist. And, and what MDMA effectively does to the brain is it increases sort of oxytocin levels so that drug that makes you love everyone and and feel kind of connected so it increases that but it it has a almost a uh, an effect where it reduces the reactivity of the amygdala which is the part of the so it's the fire alarm in the brain the fear response and so what it does is it allows people with ptsd to go in there they already have a bond with their therapist because they've done sessions beforehand uh, not on the drug, talking about sort of problems they've had, what they perhaps would like to address. And then they take the drug and they're able to effectively just talk and access the traumas without the fear response kicking in. That's one of the major problems that people have with PTSD, right? When people start to look back on their experiences, look back on what the traumas were, they... the parts of the, the emotional part of the brain starts kicking off starts making you have a physiological response you start sweating and your uh, heart rate goes up and you, you have a response like you're still there in that moment when you take mdma what seems to happen is you kind of take that fear response away from it and it allows you to then access the trauma much more easily start to put words to it start to really explain what happened. And within that, you then start to resolve it. You start to contextualize what went on, think about yourself within that trauma, perhaps reconnect with yourself at that time and within that trauma. And then following that, they then have more sessions not on the drug. And what's reported is in those sessions post the drug, they are having spoken about the trauma on the drug. They can then go back and talk about the trauma again and not have the physiological response. Having gone in there and done the work on the drug whilst, you know, the fire alarms turned down or unclipped or however else you want to think about it. You can then go back and readdress that and really do some amazing therapy work. So that's what exists currently. And as as I previously mentioned, they're going to do another round of those trials and we fingers crossed are going to have that happening in the UK alongside supported supporting wounded veterans as far as the psilocybin or ayahuasca protocols look like so I'll tell you a bit what ours look like so if you're going to go and do an, an ayahuasca retreat you would sort of sign up to heroic hearts do some work with uh, a, in, in preparation that would sort of just talk about yourself what you're looking to achieve also just looking a little bit at your lifestyle, you know, about exercise, what are you eating, you know, all these things are really important to our mental health. And then you go out, spend three or four days out on a retreat during which you would take part in an ayahuasca ceremony. And then you would come back from that and then connect with an integration therapist. So whilst you're sort of there having the experience of a psychedelic, possibly all these odd things you know like you described described you know some thoughts that that at the time feel completely mad or disconnected or maybe not relevant and you would go back with an integration therapist and often you say okay well maybe that monkey I saw come out of the tree maybe actually that's something to do with this or whatever And and you you integrate the ideas and thoughts that you had on the experience in what they might actually mean and how they might apply to you and and how you might want to interpret them When we come to the thing I'm really excited about, which is uh, our psilocybin protocol, that's going to be in Jamaica and the Netherlands. And we're taking groups of guys, and that's really important. Uh, Maybe I'll come on to that in a moment. So groups of guys who will go through a a preparation process uh, with 
a therapist before they go out. They'll then go out to retreat centers in the Netherlands or Jamaica, and they'll be there for seven days. They'll do two doses of psilocybin as a group, and they'll have the whole time they're there to talk about their experiences. You know, everyone there will be a veteran. Everyone will, you know, have a pretty similar background, and they can, you know, sit around and talk about their experiences in the military, about their experiences after they took the substance, maybe just their experiences since they left the military, et cetera, et cetera. And then coming away from that, they will then also go into an integration program with that same group that they were in, in the retreat center. And that will go on for, you know, six weeks after they come home. Psilocybin, that experience is really short though, isn't it? In, I, I, I don't mean though, it's a bad thing. Am I right in saying? So in my adult life, I have tried it once, but I didn't, I, not properly. Um, I'll explain, I didn't administer didn't it. didn't inhale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it was, it was, it was. Uh, I'll explain off air. Okay. Right. But um, uh, yeah, I don't incriminate myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the the experience lasted. It f- seemed like it lasted an hour. Mm-hmm. It was super mild. It seemed mm-hmm. like it lasted an hour. It only lasted twelve minutes. Right, and I knew that because I'd sent a text right at the start, okay. right at the start, and then put my phone down, mm-hmm. and then when I sort of well, I thought, oh, oh, well, I'm feeling right now. I'm good enough to sort of stand up. Mm-hmm. I was sat on the couch, looking at looking at pictures on the wall, and uh, well, looking at the wall, and I ended up looking at the pictures. Really mild hallucinogenic experience, like hallucinogenics, hallucinogenics. Really mild hallucinogenic experience. There was a there was a, a painting. On the wall, perhaps not the main thing I should be looking at. Actually, paint on the wall. Uh, um, a guy called Pride Bud, VC, one of VC, got killed in Afghan. Right. And he's it's a painting of him, depicted him in his last moments, bursting through, um, bursting through a field of uh, basically brush in Afghan, and the plants were moving like mm-hmm. it was incredible to look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, twelve minutes lasted, but it seemed like an hour, and I've heard that elsewhere. So, so. In that seven days when they're there, mm-hmm. the doses, how big are the doses? Quite big. <laughs> is it like an all-day um, thing? No. So psilocybin is shorter lasting than something like LSD. LSD seems to last between 8 to 12 hours, whereas psilocybin is more 4 to 6 hours so maybe you did have quite a light dose the dosage we are going to use on this we've actually thought quite a lot about it and i consulted with quite a number of people about it because i wanted to get it right obviously you don't want to give people too much and they have uh you know a full ego death experience where they (laughs) uh sort of have something frightening uh, of an experience. But another very important thing that what we want people to experience during this is this transient experience where they are really able to let go and not feel like they're trying to hang on to um, reality, I suppose would be a way of, of thinking about it. So it's a big enough dose that people will be in a f- in, in a full transient experience and not trying to fight it if that makes sense yeah um so particularly yeah i i thought a lot about the dose and and came up with the dose in the end with the guy who i mentioned in the netherlands who is a veteran himself and has done quite a lot of work with psilocybin and veterans and he said you know veterans are one of the (laughs) the worst lot for for fighting it oh yeah, and not just sort of submitting to the experience and kind of going with it. They try and uh, hang on, as it were. So that is the piece of advice I've given by multiple people. By f- before I took, well, like before I did the LSD, mm-hmm. was uh, you just yeah, just you've yeah. got to go with it. And I think it was only one moment where I, I realised I was fighting it. That, oh, you got to, oh my god, mm-hmm. you got to relax. But I could also see like uh, this could be a nightmare for someone if they couldn't. They couldn't just chill. Well, that's sort of what we want to definitely avoid is, is giving people too low a dosage. And then that's when you can have quite a frightening experience because you're 
you're sort of halfway there, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Whereas when you're fully there, you're not really want worrying too much about what normality looks like in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I think th that apprehension's a big thing, isn't it? I was flapping like a budgie before I before before that flapping like a budgie, but but there's, but there's no need, is there? But I mean, that apprehension plays badly into it as well. I can't do it anyway. Um, how do you manage the risk of? In fact, no. Um, what? How how um, how prevalent is the 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 event that? people um, generally mm. have a long-term negative impact on them from psychedelic from drug well yeah psychedelic drug use yeah so that very much depends on <coughs> how you're taking it there have been some really good guides as it were that have come out on on safe use of psychedelics and they that's sort of very much what we are attempting to strongly follow here, but we have something in psychedelic therapy called set and setting. And the set is about your mindset. So are you in an appropriate place to take it? Like it would not be appropriate, for instance, for you to take psychedelic drugs if you were in what was quite an acute distressed state, because there is a risk that you would highlight that part of your of your psyche. And then so you have to be you know prepared in some way and that's something that we do with the with the preparation before so it's not only just like you know you will be here at this time with this in your bag and you know <laughs> that kind of thing it is also about preparing yourself mentally for the experience and thinking about yourself and what you'd like to get out of it and and going in with a positive mindset but also setting is very important so there for instance you know, the Netherlands retreat, I think it will be in this, you know, a lovely little log cabin in the woods and you'll be on a bean bag and there'll be a nice music playing, uh, you know, that is, there's a lot going on now with, with psychedelic <coughs> music. And I don't just mean music that, that makes you feel like you've taken psychedelics, but the, the music that people listen to whilst on psychedelics, it turns out that's actually quite important in, in people maintaining sort of good trips. So there's that aspect to making sure, doing everything you can to mitigate the fact that somebody would have a bad trip. But then if you look at the idea of, of bad trip, sometimes difficult things happen to people when they're on psychedelics. And lots of people who absolutely swear by psychedelic therapy will all tell you about a trip they had that was very difficult. But sometimes that difficult trip is what you need what you experienced and what you learn in in that difficult time was actually what you needed to face and needed to experience. I know that's something Keith very much speaks about when, when I've spoken to him <coughs> about um, how he found sort of healing through psychedelic use. It's the, you know, the idea that this is not designed to be a recreational f fun weekend. This is designed to be a bit of a piece of therapy to help you and unfortunately sometimes therapy is confronting things that are uncomfortable um and that's why you're there right because you want to confront those things because you want to be able to not deal with them because you're either hiding them from yourself or you're trying to get through life with them in the way and so by confronting them on a psychedelic trip it's just about making sure that when people are in that uncomfortable experience that they are supported in the best way they can be. And that's by having, you know, excellent therapists who know what they're doing. And also being in, for, for me, I think it's really important uh, being in this group. So one thing that we are doing at Heroic Hearts, um, um, and it's something that we are trying to focus some of our research on as well, is the idea that these therapies may be more beneficial if administered in a group setting. And I think that's particularly meaningful when we look at veterans. I mean, when you're in the army, you are permanently in your little your little gang, right? You know, whether that's your your company, your platoon, your section, your fire team, you know, you've got your group, you've got your back. And within that group, you feel both mentally and physically safer. 
And by being around those people and developing that sort of camaraderie before people even go into the psychedelic experience, perhaps then that's going to mitigate some of the f the effect of, of of having a bad trip because you're there and you know you're safe because you've got your group around you. Yeah, def and probably the 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 common experience, mm -hmm. shared experience, which is all relatively rare, um, and then the interpretation of that. So I'm talking to you now openly about my, or I have done briefly, about my experience. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have the same conversation with someone who I knew had no experience of it whatsoever. As in, because I, I would think, how can you relate to what I'm talking about? You're going to think I'm another, what, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably part of it. In yeah. the same, yeah, in the same way, like, uh, ex well, it's the same way by veterans, like, ironing around with veterans. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> For the same reason. Absolutely. And it, it is, um, you know, like, like I say, this, that group aspect, just in general about feeling safer and everything, but particularly within the veterans community, I think from the veterans I've spoken to, a lot of it, you know, it's about sort of commonality of language. When they're talking about the experiences that they've had, you know, out in particular theatres of war, I think they feel very uncomfortable trying to explain what it was like and what they were asked to do and what and what that looked like and felt like to people who've got no idea what it might have been to you know put on all the PPE and get in the truck and drive down that road and and do all that stuff um and that really really helps and then when people come away from the experience of the retreat they have that group around them so they can call them up and say, oh, actually, I was just thinking about this thing that happened and maybe it was this. Or they can call them up and say, actually, I'm having a really shit day. <laughs> like, can you just talk to me f about something? And so they have that, that support network when they come out, not only for the integration of the experience, but also one of the things that we know is one of the biggest predictors of the development of trauma is not having excellent support groups around you that make you feel safe. Say that again, say that again. Sorry. One of the biggest predictors for people coming out of particularly things uh, like um, the army or the military and developing traumatic, something like PTSD, psychological disturbance, is n not having good networks around them that make them feel safe. So after the, after the fact of the experience later, there's not mm -hmm. a network there, and the fact that it isn't there is more likely to cause a psych psychological yeah. disturbance yeah that's interesting why yeah. is that then because they don't feel safe when you don't feel safe huh. your brain is sort of is like turned on to look for danger the whole time and then you're more likely to start manifesting on traumatic memories that existed previously whereas if you come out of um the military and go and you have a, a really supportive network around you then you're more likely to observe the traumatic memories you had in the context of you being safe now. That is fascinating. I've mm. never heard of that before. That is fa makes perfect sense, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that is fascinating. <laughs> yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. A lot of a lot of ex-military struggle when they leave mm -hmm. because they haven't got a clue what world they're in. They don't have a clue. Don't have a clue. It's completely alien to them, as it was for me. I really had a bad time with it. And I'm not, not now, because mm -hmm. I understand my place in the world now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm in a job I'm yeah. enjoy, uh, as an example. Um, and uh, and, and part, that is part, yeah, partly plays into why I'm a lot better than what I was. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, you know, why we need to have better, and, and, <laughs> and the, the military is looking into it, you know, why we need to have better management of people as they leave. And that's not just about their mental health. That's about their careers. It's about their housing. It's about their, you know, welfare in terms of relationships with their families, et cetera, et cetera. They need to be supported because those end up being triggers for, you know, PTSD. What's um, stifling the progress forward in the UK for this kind of uh, research, one, and then rolling out treatment, too, making it, making it a bona fide piece of support for people? Well, it's still very much uh, a controlled substance in the UK. It's uh, if you are you talking about MDMA here? MDMA, psilocybin, yeah. 
they're all very much controlled substances. And so in order to do research on them, it takes a huge amount of effort and financial backing to go through the bureauc bureaucracy that's required in order to conduct that kind of research. So that's obviously a major blocker. And then obviously it, it is illegal to, to do any of the work here. So there's that. There has been a number of appeals that have gone forward to the government. It was the words came out of Boris Johnson's mouth that he was you know looking into the use of psychedelics for treatment of things like PTSD and would be considering it. But that was said, A, by Boris Johnson, and B, six <laughs> months ago, um, when I think things he probably thought things were a little bit rosier, and as we just saw in the last couple of weeks, the government has come out with the <coughs> classic we will be hard on drugs line, which we all know works so well. Oh, the, the mi middle class drug users, we will take your driving license away or, or something like that. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you not? No. Um, well, that was um, a grapple at popularity last week that they did. So, so the government has made noises towards the idea that they are going to revisit the use of psychedelics for treatment of certain psychi uh, psychiatric disorders and perhaps that would be um, something that would, would, would have been more likely but I, I've got a feeling it might have just got kicked into the long grass. So we would need that to be re-looked at. What we want is increase in availability to researchers to be able to use this stuff and then a look at perhaps something like a compassionate use like they have in Canada for... Um, anxiety with uh, something like maybe a veterans population in the UK. If we could say, okay, well, com if we can prove this stuff works, if we can complete our studies out in um, the Netherlands and Jamaica and come forward with all of the stuff that's coming out clinically and say to you, we've got a protocol that works and show you the figures on the number of veterans in this country who are unfortunately taking their own lives or on huge amounts of substances that mean that they're you know existing they're not really living it because they're trying to manage their the symptomology of ptsd would you not then say on a balance of risk etc cetera, etc cetera, we should be able to use that in a compassionate use sense so that would be an ideal aim for me and that's something at heroic hearts we're setting our focus on getting a, a compassionate use case for it and then going forward we'd start to develop clinics for their use but exactly what those clinics look like we're not quite sure yet. There is some <coughs> models that exist out there, like ketamine use. That's now um, that's now available for the treatment of depression and, and has been used for PTSD. Cannabis is cannabis is used, right? What, what where is yeah. cannabis? What role does cannabis play in all this? So, cannabis. Uh, I, I have a bit of a. I, I'm not quite sure exactly how I feel about cannabis use for the treatment of PTSD, just because. Uh, have a joint, you feel great. Yeah, feel great maybe that would change your mind. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so cannabis is now available on prescription in the UK, but those prescriptions are pretty much all private. So you can access cannabis, and I'm talking dried cannabis that you vape on a prescription oh. if you go to a specific cannabis prescribing doctor with your condition. And I believe that. PTSD is one of those conditions that you can have it prescribed for. The argument for its use there is that that cannabis is of a particular strain and therefore composition that mean it's not the kind of stuff that you would get off the street that is made to be bang for your buck. So it's got really high amounts of THC, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, <coughs> but very low amounts of C. CBD, which is the um, the sort of moderating effect in cannabis. So the stuff that you would get from a prescription is much more balanced in its composition. And it does show some good effects for pain relief and anti-anxiety. So in my mind, where it holds really good value in the PTSD community is when you've got veterans who are taking 
lots of medication that are particularly focused around hypervigilance and anxiety and stuff like that, it can sort of chill you out and remove the um, permanent state of, of feeling kind of panicked and looking for danger and all of that. But I wouldn't like to think of it as an end point where you say, okay, well, you're just going to take cannabis every day for the rest of your life. I think it works as a very good stepping stone between being traditionally pharmacologically medicated to then looking for proper healing, proper finding peace, proper, you know, being better. I think we have a bit of an issue with mental health is that we just think we just stabilize people. We don't get them better. And where psychedelics play a part is that they are that stepping stone for people to get better. And there's work that comes with that. There's a lot of therapy and self-reflection and all the rest of it that comes with using psychedelics for the treatment of trauma. But it allows you to open the door. And so many people are at a position where they can do as much CBT as they like or as much EDMR or as much, you know, other stuff. But they're just not in a place where they can physically open that door and, and walk through it into their new life, whereas psychedelics kind of offers you that that breakthrough moment. Mm. What about CBD oil? Yeah, so CBD, very well marketed. Um, it's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you mean by that? No, I'm being really mean. <laughs> so from what we know at the moment with CBD, it's it's <clears throat> it shows great promise and there is a lot of good evidence to suggest it is useful in a number of applications but not quite as many as Holland and Barrett perhaps would have you believe it's slightly over marketed but more in the fact that we just haven't had the time to run the clinical trials and to run the animal trials and the cell based uh, cell line trials to fully understand exactly what it does where it works and what it works CBD on CBD in general you mean yeah don't get me wrong it's got great evidence and if it works for you brilliant go for it and there's good evidence behind the fact that it works as um, an antipsychotic and potentially good for addiction and also as an anti-anxiety medication and that evidence does exist but the the that evidence is is still quite a small pool of evidence do you know if the C, if it's a CBD and CBD oil CBD oil is as bioavailable as it is when you smoke weed or not are you aware or not? No. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, I'm afraid. Because you get varying percentages, don't you? Yeah. Don't, okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. Um, oh, well, I was going to ask you a question then. Um, oh, come on, you. Oh, uh, back to your point about um, uh, the the willingness to medicate to maintain maintain mm -hmm. uh, a sustainable m mental or physical state as opposed to working towards improving it mm -hmm. is really important. It's something I've completely changed my opinion on over the last few years, especially when it comes to mental ill health. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've talked previously about this a pin drop, a pin drop, a, a penny drop moment that I had with a the therapist. Mm -hmm. While I was, I was, I did the, I did this course of therapy while I was doing the podcast. I think it was in the first year or the second year in the podcast I actually had him on the therapist on then later Dirk anyway he said something now I don't dis I don't agree with now <laughs> <laughs> but the penny drop moment was he said that, uh, have you ever cons have you ever considered that who you are now that's who you are so what you are now it's who you are yeah and, and, and that trying to put yourself to where you were what you were mentally mm -hmm. capable of mm -hmm. then you no, this is who you are now. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to accept it. He didn't say you have to accept it. That's who you are now. Yeah. He, su he suggested that to me. I was like, yeah, that's, the, that's yes, bang on. And now, I'm like, no, no. Because, it, and we're going off on a tangent here, but I think it's important just to, it's, it's been an important lesson for me. And the, the reason being is that, so things at the time, things like my focus is just really, well, I really poor concentration. Mm -hmm. I general anxiety, quite a lot of anxiety but generally I wasn't as good as what I was before as 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 content and so I accepted at the time well that's who I am now yeah I just haven't got as much focus as I did then but other, but other things I've got better um, mm -hmm. better at which was nothing 
Um, but now, where I am now, no, no, no. I've improved things through working, mm-hmm. through actually actively going and trying to improve myself in different ways and learning. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons in the podcast right now, right? Um, and that's a really important thing. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Trying to find a flipping cure as opposed mm-hmm. to just maintaining it. Good example of the cannabis, yeah. that actually. Yeah, it's a good example but of the cannabis. You just reminded me of, of uh, another one of my favorite quotes. You know, no man ever stands in the same river twice for yeah, uh, he is not, the, it is not the same river and he is not the same man. And I think that is incredibly true. You're right. I think some people are just perhaps they come out of school and they, you know, the microwave ding goes off and they're right, I'm done. <laughs> and you're like, no. Every day is a school day. There's always an opportunity to get better in some way or other, whether that's your, you know, your cross stitch or your 2K run. There's always an opportunity to to get better and particularly with our mental health. And that's why I, you know, we say that the psychedelic experience in, in, in the pursuit of, of, of better mental health is an important step on a long road and you're never done. You are never done. You you constantly got work to do. I think we actually live in, in a world where people are getting a lot better at that. If you look at what's popular in terms of, um, you know, what, what are the top 10 books or anything? There are all these sort of how to improve yourself um, mentally. And that's kind of fantastic. Well, I, I, another book I really, really enjoyed, I know we briefly talked about books earlier, but it's called Stealing Fire. Okay. And it talks about psychedelic use in there, but also a lot about sort of people searching this flow state. But it talks about, you know, what makes somebody able to become a Navy SEAL? You know, of all the people that go there on the selection, they're all physically capable, but only sort of 10, 20 percent of them are mentally capable of doing it. And I think we're getting a lot better at looking at sort of really fine tuning our minds and fine tuning our bodies to be better. And that's what I sort of want to say to 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 veterans. Like, you stop th- feeling like your life is sort of over and you just have to exist with this. You you don't at all. You can make the choices to be this new person, to be who you are now, post your time in the military. What is it that you want to achieve next? And look for that. Look for meaning. Very good words. Very good words, Chris. <laughs> Are you getting any political support whatsoever? Is Heroic Hearts getting any political support? If so, where's it coming from? Yep. So we have um, one of the trustees is a chap called uh, Chris Bin Blunt, who is an MP in the Conservative Party. He sits at the head of the... Um, oh, God, I forgot the name of it now. It, Conservative for Drug Change group, who are continuously lobbying the government for changes to drug laws to be somewhat more reflective of what risk might actually be um, from drug use, which they are not at the moment. They're all about political stuff. So we have him and then we are hooked up through people that also work with, that work with us and work with them with a, a, a I'm not sure, is it, is it a company or is it a... Um, drug Science, who are, are um, a body of people that basically put out a lot of stuff about um, risk, et cetera, et cetera, and they are continuously lobbying the government and looking for ways of best disseminating information to the public that's based on what we actually know as scientists and not what politicians perceive people want to hear. Mm-hmm. It's a problem at the moment, mm-hmm. right? With other yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the big C, um, not cancer. Uh, okay, that's good. Well, that's good. The, the, the support, is, the support is good. I've heard of that conservative drug policy change group. I heard yeah. it from Keith. Keith told me about yeah. it. Keith told me about it. Yeah, that's good. What was that politician's name? Crispin Blunt. Okay, Crispin. Oh, Crispin Blunt. Yeah, of course. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. There are a few other um, MPs in Parliament who are sort of aware of this and interested in making it happen but it has been difficult to speak to others i know that previous veterans ministers have not been willing to be publicly listening so Uh, hopefully that will change yeah hopefully i mean i i think it seems that we're getting more we're moving towards 
legalization of cannabis, I think, mm-hmm. I reckon, just because the states have done yeah. it. And it's well, pe- Germany um, has pretty anything. much changed, yeah, and Malta, I think it was Malta. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and the reason I point that out is because I think that that is a that opens up more opportunity for other things, doesn't it? I mean, if mm-hmm. if if that drug gets that substance gets legalized, then it probably makes the path towards re- MDMA research, the kind of research you're talking about doing, more. Uh, more plausible, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes that research a lot cheaper, which means that we can actually do it on more people and therefore have significant enough numbers that we can turn around and say, now will you believe us <laughs> kind of thing. So that's really important that we can conduct the research on enough people. And then you can fine tune how you you, you do various treatments. But I completely agree with you, um, I guess some people might see cannabis as the thin end of the wedge, but maybe that, that, that's a necessary wedge that we need to to look at. So I, as we move towards using that more, the the psyche of I think of, of the general public is you know drugs are drugs, which as a as a neuroscientist it is is a bit bit silly really, because that's like saying food is food and comparing a McDonald's burger to a lettuce like they're they're quite different things. <laughs> And so as the psyche of the public changes to the idea that cannabis use could be more acceptable um, and potentially beneficial in some capacity, then they will start to be able to see that it, that could be apl- applicable to other drugs. And then we can start to break apart the idea that everything that is an illegal drug is the same thing because it isn't. <laughs> Yeah, well, fingers crossed, hopefully. It'll keep going the way it's going. I mean, signs are good. Police don't bat an eyelid now, do they? I don't think. No, I believe there's certain... Um, there's certain there's thresholds, isn't there? Yeah, there's, uh, yeah if, if you are quite clearly out there doing majorly crim- criminal drug dealing, then then you probably get pulled in, but that, that that's for many other reasons. Whereas if you're just walking down the road with some cannabis in your pocket, I believe a few different... Um, the police departments have said that they would turn a blind eye to that, right, rightly or wrongly. That's up to you what you think about that, if whether the, the law is the law. I think another you know, place that we have to start looking at, and it's a really, really difficult one, is having this conversation with the military. And what they think about this, we all know what the line is. The line is zero tolerance, you will lose your career, on your first offence. And I can completely understand why they take that stance in some sense, but then you look at how much alcohol gets consumed on base. In, you know, the state of people in a mess sometimes, <laughs> you think, hang on, I think I'd rather these people had all just smoked a joint than drank a bottle of port or whatever else. And so maybe, you know, trying to start a conversation with the military that's a little bit more sensible about all substance use. If I had the choice, I, I absolutely agree. If I had the choice, well, yeah, if I had the choice between uh, legal, so leg, uh, keeping alcohol legal or legalizing mm-hmm. weed, but legalizing cannabis, right? But but at the cost of losing alcohol and making that illegal, I take the cannabis every single time for the points you just made. You will not see someone, mm-hmm. and this isn't the uh, legalized cannabis podcast, right? We're not talking about that. But it's, it's an exact. It's a really yeah. good. It's a really good um, uh, uh, observation you brought up. I mean, with the military, the problem there is <sighs> ignoring the the alcohol piece. Just a, mm-hmm. That's just a complete contradiction in what the what they stand for. Mm-hmm. Right? They kind of. I, I think you know. It's um, if they were to say, yeah. Let's let's accept that as a treatment, for example, mm-hmm. MDMA or some other substance or in cannabis. Mm-hmm. Then it's the the abuse that would get, like mm-hmm. alcohol gets abused, yeah. right? Although there's no positive impacts about. Well, arguably there are a couple, but but yeah, that's the drama. That is that is a that is a long game. That one mm-hmm. <laughs> getting the, getting the military to yeah. accept it. Flipping so out. you say it's a long game. I I think they there is definitely a huge amount of recognition within the military that is only growing around firstly PTSD as a whole and you're finally getting 
you know, the big cheeses coming out and saying, actually, I had a problem and all the rest of it. And that, that has been incredibly important as far as reducing stigma and getting other people to come forward and say, actually, uh, you know, I've had a problem. But they are seeing that there is a great need for improved treatments because what we have now is is quite frankly not acceptable in for in as far as treatments that seem to actually work and so they are opening their minds to the idea that new treatments need to be found and if these new treatments are psychedelic psychedelics or MDMA or something like that or cannabis then surely how can they hold the line mm -hmm. very good hopefully fingers crossed what have we um what have we is there anything we haven't covered that you wanted to cover i'm trying to think now um i think we've covered quite a bit i mean i could talk for hours and hours and hours about this i guess one thing i i i'd like to mention sort of briefly i know that you've had a number of people on your podcast previously who've been here talking about traumatic brain injuries and I know I, I haven't really gone largely into the biology around what psychedelics can do in the brain, and perhaps that's something you're going to do um, with my colleague Simon in the future, but traumatic brain injuries are incredibly prevalent in the veterans community, and we actually see a huge link between that and the development of PTSD because of what traumatic brain injuries do in the brain. They increase the likelihood of basically slowing down that thinking and, and making brain circuits more rigid, taking you back to what I was talking at, about at the start. And there's incredible evidence in the sporting world of people who have been, you know, at death's door in, in the way that they were very strongly deciding how they were going to take their own lives. And they've then turned to psychedelics and managed to to turn that completely around and on looking at images of their brain and and looking at how their brain functions as well as other biological markers have seen great improvements so not only are these psychedelics sort of helping on a psychological perspective but we're seeing really amazing evidence from a biological perspective they may be not only helping you rewire your brain to help with mental illness but to help with physical illness as well and so I think that's something we're going to see an awful lot more coming from um, the psychedelic research community is people looking into that. And I think that would be incredible because that doesn't just help the veterans community, that helps the sporting community and anybody else who is unfortunate enough to be in an accident that can be, unfortunately, completely life-changing. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. You've got the, you know, we've been talking the entire podcast about reparation, you know, repairing mm -hmm problems mm -hmm. when as you quite rightly pointed out there's opportunity here to improve a mental state mm -hmm. or a physical state which may actually be well especially in a mental state might be all right but you mm -hmm. can improve it it's the same way i i look at sort of mental health tools tools to impact your mental health now mm -hmm. like you mentioned yoga meditation getting outside sitting down chilling give you your, your brain mm -hmm. opportunity to get its own space <clears throat> i have in the past been exposed to those to repair myself mentally mm -hmm. i now use those to repair myself when i need to right mm -hmm. but also to put my brain into a, a state of yeah. optimum performance when i need it to be there exam course difficult meeting um <laughs> potential conflict with uh with a family member you yeah. know uh, it, it, it's a really good point you mentioned that is going to be for another podcast you were more than well. I really enjoyed, really enjoyed today. You said you can speak for hours about it, and yeah. I would listen for hours. So we should do this again, definitely. Absolutely. And we've got Simon's coming on. Yeah. Yeah, as well. So um, it's been a pleasure, Grace. Yeah, it's absolute been absolutely pleasure. wonderful. I would love to come back. Hopefully, we are going to COVID permitting. We are going to complete um, our initial study using psilocybin for the treatment of veterans who have got psychological disturbances. Um, and a history of traumatic brain injuries. And I'd love to come back and discuss how that went. What, is that early next year? <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully so. Fingers crossed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how do people um, get hold of you and how do people follow Heroic Hearts? So Heroic Hearts and Heroic Hearts UK both have their own websites and Instagram. Oh, no, they don't have Instagram, I don't think. Uh, Twitter, etc., etc. So please look them up online. 
Um, if you want to follow me, I have a I have a Twitter. I think Doctor Blessed Hopley, um, where I sort of try and spread the odd pearl of wisdom when I come across it, and generally just support us. And and even if that doesn't look you know like traditional support, what we really want is to start a conversation and start a conversation in the veterans community about you know have you heard about this and getting people to perhaps consider this as a potential treatment for themselves. What we want to see and what the whole organisation is about is about having an improved life for people post-military service. Very good. And thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Heroic Hearts too. very, very important work and um, obviously going to be benef- very beneficial. Cool. Hopefully. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they're only released to patrons. They never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of H-Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.